Welcome to Mariner's Church. I'm so glad that you're here for our online service and love that we get to come just as we are from wherever we are. Each week we gather to lift our voices in praise, to hear from God's word and to listen to the Holy Spirit to hear what he might be saying to us today. If you're watching with us live, I encourage you to say hi in the chat, tell us where you're from and know that we're here to pray with you one on one. And each week it's such a joy for us to be able to connect with you. Let's worship together now. There is no shadow that has ever overcome your life, and there is no rival that could ever stand against your might. You've always been with us, every battle you've already won, you've already won. Oh.
Amen. It is so amazing to continue our hearts of thankfulness in this season. And I cannot believe, but Christmas is coming up and we have something very special for you, our online audience. We wanna encourage you to celebrate this Christmas season with your family, your friends, your neighbors. So we'd love to provide you with a Christmas kit to have during our Christmas Eve services. We're gonna have invite cards for you to be able to share, some discussion questions and kid resources and fun Christmas items. So text the word host to the number below to receive your Christmas kit. And next week, we're launching our Christmas series and Pastor Eric will be back with us. But today we have the joy of hearing from our North Irvine pastor, Steve Bingley. So let's jump into God's word together. It's so great to sing of our Jesus who loves us and he gave his life for us. Welcome to Mariners Online. It's so great to worship with you today. You know, there was a time uh, in my life when during Thanksgiving dinner, we actually had an intruder come to our house. I mean, the day started off great. Uh, our family, we had an amazing day and we were so excited for, for Thanksgiving dinner and oh, the vibes, the vibes, it was festive. Uh, the wife and the kids, they were in a great mood. We had communicated clearly with our family members. We could hear just a football game blaring through the TV on the other side of the room, and it was time to eat dinner. And so we all kind of gathered around uh, the dinner table, and we prayed together, and we dove into the food, and oh my gosh, it was amazing. Thanksgiving dinner could not have been any better. But at that moment, the doorbell rang. Now, my first thought was, I had no idea that Amazon delivered on Thanksgiving Day. But then my second thought was, who in the world would just show up unannounced to a Thanksgiving dinner? I mean, I, I was surprised. And so I got up from my dinner table seat and, and I, I walked over to the door and I opened the door and to my great surprise stood my cousins. My cousins, they were there. They showed up because they completely forgot about our dinner plans, which was that we had all agreed as a family that this year we were canceling the big family gathering, but they showed up unannounced. And so even though they were my family members in that moment, I mean, they, they felt like intruders. I was like, dude, like, what are you doing here? Like, you're, you're not supposed to be here. I was totally surprised, but it all worked out great. You know, we, we kicked them out, they left, and we as a family got to enjoy our nice dinner. It, it, was, it was spectacular. <laughs> But you know, I, I share that because while in that scenario, the intruders may not have been my enemies, there are other intruders that we encounter that do seek to harm us. Now, these intruders, they're not physical intruders who are trying to get into our, our house or our car per se, but these are intrusive thoughts, intrusive thoughts that try to enter and creep into our mind to harm us. These thoughts, they're not just any thoughts. They're not negative thoughts, but they are accusatory and condemning thoughts. Accusatory and condemning thoughts. We know what these thoughts are like, don't we? These are the thoughts that, that point the finger of blame at you to keep the guilt and shame on you. I mean, these are the thoughts that they kind of start this way. They start with, why would you do such a thing? Or, or how could you let that happen? Or didn't you think to consider why would you do that? These are the thoughts that point the finger of blame at you to keep the guilt and shame on you. I mean, some of us, we may have had some of these thoughts creep into our minds and invade our minds even this week, maybe even during Thanksgiving dinner. Maybe you were sitting at the dinner table and, and you looked around who was at the table and then you start to think about who wasn't at that table. And this thought started to intrude in your mind. This thought that said, you know, if you had just been a better parent, if you were more engaged and available when they were young, if you had just tried a little bit harder, they would be here right now. This is your fault. The finger of blame pointed at you to keep the guilt and shame on you. Or it may have been earlier this week, Maybe you were scrolling through your social media account and, and that person's profile popped up and you remembered just the relationship or the friendship that, that kind of broke apart. I mean, it started out with a little misunderstanding, 
but there was no clarity and communication. And over time that kind of lingered and that started to fracture the relationship. And there was one heated moment in that moment, you let these angry words fly out that you instantly regretted. And that was the point where the relationship went past the point of no return. And when you saw that person's profile, here's the thought that intruded your mind. Don't forget what you did, what you said. How could you say such hurtful things? Don't think that you've changed much. The finger of blame pointed at you to keep the guilt and shame on you. You may have felt this way even, even today. Maybe even as you were trying to tune in online to worship with our Mariners community. Maybe as you heard the worship music blaring, you started to feel the sting of accusation. Maybe you even feel that way right now. Maybe there's a part of you that thinks, oh, if the people on the screen, if they knew my past, if they knew my past, if they even knew my present, what had happened in the here and now, they would all discard me. They would want nothing to do with me. We are all familiar with accusatory and condemning thoughts. And in some of us, we are drowning in accusing thoughts. It's almost as if a laser pointer is pointed at us. And no matter where we run to, no matter how hard we run, we just can't seem to escape. It, it's almost like we can't get past our past. And so today I want us to look at the scriptures because I believe the scriptures will encourage us, especially those of us who are wrestling and struggling with accusatory thoughts. And we're gonna do this by answering two key questions. First, why does this happen? Why do accusatory and condemning thoughts invade our minds? Why? And then secondly, we're gonna explore what we can do about it, what we can do about it. And so to get there, we're gonna look at a, a section in the Bible, in the book of Zechariah. Now, Zechariah uh, is an Old Testament book. He was a prophet. And to give you some context, Zechariah was given to the people about 500 years before Christ's arrival on the earth. But Zechariah was also given to the people of God 20 years after God's people in the Old Testament, the Israelites, returned from their exile in Babylon to their land. But at this time, God's people, they were, they were discouraged, which surprises us because, I mean, they had returned from exile. Wouldn't they be happy? But they were discouraged because life was not like what it was prior to the exile. See, they were, they were God's chosen people. They were the Israelites. They were supposed to be powerful and influential, but that was not the case. And so it led to fear and disillusionment. See, this was their struggle. See, their struggle before the exile was, they struggled to believe that God would actually exile them because of their sins. In other words, they struggled to believe that in a God who would judge. But now after the exile, they struggled to believe in a God that loves them. They struggle to believe in a God who loves them despite their disobedience. And so God, who is so kind and gracious, he wants to encourage his people. And so he deposits into Zechariah the prophet, a word of encouragement through eight prophetic visions. Now, visions, simply put, are spiritual realities that are communicated through earthly imageries. Spiritual realities communicated through earthly imageries. Now, there's eight visions. We're not gonna look at all of them. We're just gonna look at one of them, the fourth vision. And I think this vision will communicate to us and help us to understand the reality of maybe why some of these accusatory thoughts come our way. Here's what we see in, in God's word in Zechariah chapter three, verse one. The word of God reads, then he, that's God, he showed me, Zechariah, the high priest, Joshua, standing before the angel of the Lord with Satan standing at his right side to accuse him. Now, right off the bat here in this vision, we're introduced to three characters. First, we see someone named Joshua. Now, this Joshua, he's not the same Joshua that followed Moses, but this Joshua is still significant because he represents the people of God as the high priest, so Joshua. Secondly, we have someone named the angel of the Lord. Now, many uh, smart and nerdy 
people have gone back and forth to identify who this angel of the Lord is. Many believe and agree that this angel of the Lord is none other than the pre-incarnate Christ, that he is God himself. And then there's a third character, Satan, who we're going to talk about in a moment. Now, what, what are they doing in this uh, earthly imagery scene, this vision? What, what are they doing? Are they just hanging out? Are they playing cards? Well, what we see in this picture, this imagery, is that of a heavenly courtroom, a heavenly courtroom. We know this because of the way that Zechariah depicts the way that they interact with each other. Did you notice that? It says that Joshua, he was, he was standing before, he was standing before the angel of the Lord, who was standing there as, as the judge. God is the judge. But to his right side, there is a prosecutor. To, to Joshua's right side, there's a prosecutor, Satan, who is accusing him, and Joshua is standing there as as the defendant. So in this imagery, you have Joshua, the defendant, who is being accused by the prosecutor, Satan, who is at his right side, accusing him, the defendant, to the judge, who is the Lord, who is God. So here we see some profound spiritual realities being communicated through this vision. I mean, first, we get a spiritual reality about God. We see that our God, he is the one rightful judge. This is because he's perfect. He's perfect and without sin. And so his opinions should weigh and matter more than anyone else. God is the judge. But we also get a profound spiritual reality about Satan, namely that Satan, he is the one who accuses he condemns God's people. He loves to point the finger of blame at God's people to keep the guilt and shame on God's people. Not right off the bat, I can hear the objections that some of us may be having. Some of us, maybe we did not grow up in the church and this is what you're thinking. Here's your objection. You're going, seriously, bro? Like that you actually, you believe in an invisible being that is trying to wreak havoc. And like you actually believe that Christians are being accused by Satan. And I'm gonna be honest, just confession time. As a pastor, I always struggled uh, with talking about things like Satan and demons, especially to those who affirmed a Western secular worldview, to those who were uh, affirmed a naturalistic worldview, because I felt like if I talked about demons, they would think I'm crazy. But here's why I don't really feel that way anymore. This is because every year that passes, as we see the, the chaos and the atrocities in this world, I, I believe it is more intellectually honest to affirm the possibility of an agent of chaos than it is logically honest to bypass and exclude that possibility and to simply try to explain away the chaos in the world to things like a lack of education or a lack of funding or that we need more technology. Here's why. Because in our world today, we have many very educated individuals who have a ton of money and we have access to the most advanced technology that history has ever seen. And yet there is great evil in our world happening. So in other words, it is more emotionally agreeable and it is more logically agreeable to affirm the position that's been held historically by many, many Christians and even present today by many Christians in the global world that there is someone, an invisible being who is living as an agent of chaos. That feels more intellectually honest. But now there's a, a second objection and this might be from those who, who grew up in the church. And your objection is this, hey, hey like I, I get it. I affirm the existence of Satan, but, but you said that he loves to accuse. And here's why we're thrown off by that. We're thrown off because we grew up in the church being told that Satan loves to tempt, that he is always tempting us. And so when we hear right now that he accuses, we're kind of thrown off. So wait, does he tempt or does he accuse? Let's untangle this together. Satan does tempt, but after he tempts, he then accuses. I'll explain it this way. See, this is Satan's one-two punch combo. This is his tactic. See, Satan, he, he throws the first punch, the first punch of temptation, 
And in this first punch, he's trying to convince you of the lie that something other than God satisfies. But once he can land this punch, he will then change his stance and try to land the second punch of accusation. In other words, if he can get you to believe the lie that something other than God satisfies, then he will then try to get you to believe the lie that God now wants nothing to do with you. This is a deadly combination, and this is how he moves. In fact, um, a Puritan thinker named uh, Thomas Brooks, he once said this about Satan's schemes. He said, until we have sinned, Satan is a parasite. When we have sinned, he is a tyrant. Isn't this so true? I mean, even when we see the story of the Bible, I mean, in the beginning, uh, in the book of Genesis, we see the serpent in the garden like a parasite tempting God's people to sin. But in the last book of the Bible, in Revelation, specifically Revelation 12, 10, we see the same serpent accusing God's people day and night like a tyrant. This is who he is. In fact, did you know that the word Satan in the Old Testament Hebrew, it literally means prosecutor. It literally means accuser. This means that Satan accusing God's people, condemning, this is central to who he is. This is what he does. If this is true, then there is a third spiritual reality for, for us, which we see in, in the person of Joshua the high priest, which is that on this side of eternity, God's people, we will often be caught between two voices that are trying to influence us. Now, the first voice is, is the voice of our Jesus, whose voice is louder and yet more gentle. He's the one who saves us and rescues us. And yet at the same time, at our right side will also be the voice of accusation. Now, I'm not saying that Satan is the only reason for why we feel condemning thoughts, but he is one reason. And maybe this is why for some of us, gosh, no matter how hard we try, it just feels like we can't distract ourselves or distance ourselves from these condemning thoughts that haunt our minds. And maybe as you're watching, you feel frustrated. You're saying, I know God is close. I know he's near. I know he's near, but why does it also feel like these accusing thoughts are near as well? Well, did you hear what the text said? It said that Satan was at Joshua's right side. It's fascinating language, isn't it? Right side. That communicates closeness and active engagement. This is what he does. He points the finger of blame at us to keep the shame and guilt on us. So what do we do? What do we do as God's people? Well, there are at least two things that we can do. Here's the first one. We give our thoughts Christ. We can give our thoughts Christ. In other words, we, we fill our minds, we fill our minds with the person of Christ, who he is, what he has done on our behalf. We fill our minds with the gospel what he has done for us, we give our minds, we give our thoughts, Christ. Now you might be disappointed by that. Well, I wanna do battle, that thing. I don't wanna just think, give me something more. But I would argue this is one of the most powerful things that you and I could do to battle against the thoughts of accusation. I think this will become more clear once we see how this vision and this story unfolds. Notice what it says here in verse two. The scripture says, the Lord, that's the angel of the Lord, said to Satan, the Lord, that's God the Father, rebuke you, Satan. May the Lord who has chosen Jerusalem, that's God's people, rebuke you. Isn't this man Joshua a burning stick snatched from the fire? Now, Joshua was dressed with filthy clothes as he stood before the angel. So the angel of the Lord spoke to those standing before Joshua, take off his filthy clothes. Then he said to him, see, I have removed your iniquity from you and I will clothe you with festive robes. Now, there's so many beautiful things in this passage, but there's one thing that is screaming very loudly in the text that we just read, which is, did you notice who is the primary actor 
in the verses we read. I'll tell you who is not the primary actor, Joshua. You notice Joshua does not have a big role uh, in this story. I mean, he doesn't speak up for himself. He doesn't defend himself. Like he's pretty passive. More than anything that Joshua does, we see a lot of what Joshua does not do. You notice what he doesn't do? I mean, first of all, he, he doesn't accuse back. He doesn't put on his boxing gloves and try to accuse Satan back. I mean, he could have. He could have said, oh, really, you want to do this? All right, well, let me bust out some theology, Satan. God is preparing a place for you called hell. How do you like them apples? He doesn't do that. He does not step in to the ring of accusation and go 12 rounds. You know what else Joshua does not do? He doesn't try to justify his own actions. You notice Joshua, he didn't say, well, actually, you know, Satan, that was a really tough season in my life. And, you know, according to my Enneagram profile, like when I'm unhealthy, he doesn't say that. He does not say, you know, my therapist was telling me. He, he does not, he doesn't even say a single word. You know what else Joshua does not do? He does not try to make things right by simply doing more good things. You notice he was wearing filthy robes, which symbolized his sins. He doesn't try to take it off and wash it. He doesn't go to the store of moral behavior and righteous works to try to buy new clothes for himself. He does nothing. Who is the primary actor in the story that we just read? It is the angel of the Lord. It is God himself. God is the one who speaks. God is the one who acts. God is the one who defends. Now, we need to be honest too. There's something that God doesn't do either. God does not make excuses for Joshua's sins either. You notice God did not say, you know, Joshua, I was looking at your sins. And, you know, to be honest, it's not that bad. Like there's this guy, Mark. Oh my gosh. Like you're honest, you're doing great. God doesn't do that. God does not deny Joshua's sins. He doesn't minimize Joshua's sins. He doesn't uh, uh, downplay it. He does something better and so much more beautiful. He replaces, he replaces his filthy robes with brand new festive robes. See, the spiritual truth that's communicated here is none other than the good news of Jesus, the gospel. See, here's what our gospel says. The gospel starts with some bad news, but it's true news, which is that you and I, we, we've messed up. We sinned, we screwed up. We've fallen short of God's perfect standards. We've fallen short of our own standards. We are wearing filthy robes. But here's what's amazing. This angel of the Lord, he came to this world fully man, fully God, in the person of Jesus Christ. And he lived the perfect righteous life that you and I could not live. He met God's standards. And then he died the death that we were already dying because of our sins. And really the death that we were supposed to die because of the penalty of our sins, he paid that penalty on our behalf. And so when Jesus rises again, when he rose again, it was, God's receipt to say, look, the debt has been paid. Where the judge says, for those who have trusted in me, you have been justified. I know that's a big word, but what that really means is you are now declared righteous. You're declared innocent. You're free to go. There is no more penalty to pay. That's your reality if you've trusted in Jesus, which means, so when you and I are living and, and the accusing intrusive thoughts come our way and the accuser tries to uh, condemn us with certain thoughts, in that moment, we don't even have to try to defend ourselves. Instead, we allow Jesus, our defense attorney, to come and speak on our behalf. That's what he does for us. And so let's say the, the accuser comes. And he says, oh, you know what? God wants nothing to do with you. You know that, right? All, after all that you've done, God wants nothing to do with you. But in that moment, our Jesus, our defense attorney, he steps in and he says to us, like he said to Joshua, the Lord has chosen Jerusalem. See, if you've placed your trust in Jesus, did you know that God chose you? He wanted you. He's pursuing you even now. He loves you. And so he speaks on our behalf. 
Then maybe the accuser will try to say something else. He'll say, that may be true, but you know what? You need to pay for what you did. You need to pay for what you did. But our Jesus, he steps in and he defends us. He says, no, this person, you and I, we are a burning stick that has been snatched out of the fire. In other words, if you've trusted Jesus, there's no no more penalty to pay. There is no more punishment that we, that, that we bear because Jesus bore all of it. There's no more wrath to deal with. Maybe the accuser might come and say, that may all be true, but you know what? You need to know you're filthy. I saw what you did. But in that moment, our Jesus steps in and he says, no, I have removed your iniquity and I've robed you with festive robes. If you've trusted Jesus, you are currently covered by perfect righteousness. Not your righteousness, no. Not your righteousness, by his perfect righteousness. Jesus is our defense attorney. This is why the scriptures often talk about Jesus as our advocate. In other words, he pleads on our behalf. He pleads on our behalf. He says to God the Father, here's what he does not say. He does not say, oh God, please just give them one more chance. Give them, that is not what he says. Instead, our Jesus, our advocate says, oh Father, you must not listen to these accusations. It would be unjust for you to listen to these accusations because I have already paid the penalty in full. They are forgiven because I have paid the penalty on their behalf. Here's what Romans 8.33 says. These words are so beautiful. Who can bring an accusation against God's elect? No one. God is the one who justifies. Who is the one who condemns? No one. Because Christ Jesus is the one who died, but even more has been raised. He also is at the right hand of God and intercedes for us. Who can separate us from the love of Christ? No one. You have an advocate. So here's what this means, Christian follower of Jesus. You may have an accuser at your right side, but you have an advocate at the Father's side. You may have an accuser at your right side, but you and I, we have an advocate at our Father's side and he speaks on our behalf. And so when the accuser comes our way and tries to deposit unhelpful thoughts, we can simply give our minds more Christ. When the accuser reminds us of what we've done, we just remind ourselves of what he's done. We redirect our thoughts to Christ. We think about the gospel. We give our thoughts Christ. Practically speaking, this might mean maybe just memorizing one verse that is really helpful for you. It could be a verse like Romans 8.1, which says, there is now therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. It might be Romans 3.23 3, 23 to 24, which says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. They are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Or it might mean that you get to so familiar with the gospel that you can say the gospel as quickly as you can give someone your cell phone number. So when the accuser comes, you can give your thoughts Christ. Give your thoughts Christ. But there's a second thing that we can do. That's not just to give our thoughts Christ, but it's also to take our thoughts captive. In other words, we don't simply let any intrusive thought enter into our minds and allow it to take root in our soul. Instead, we consider what kind of a thought it might be. Is it a healthy thought? Is it a harmful thought? and we interact with it as it actually is. Second Corinthians 10.5, Paul the apostle says this, we take every thought captive to obey Christ. We take every thought captive. So what does this look like? Well, maybe it looks a little bit like, like the scene that, that I described earlier when we had an intruder come into our house for, for Thanksgiving dinner. Let's imagine, we're just gonna recreate that scenario. Let's imagine that this dinner table is your mind. It's my mind. Now, different thoughts are gonna try to come in and and take a seat and have uh, have a seat at the table. And so we have a choice of simply allowing any thought to come in and have a seat at the table and dine and and we feed that thought. 
or we can take it captive and tell that thought to go elsewhere. So let's imagine that we're here and the doorbell rings. The doorbell rings and, and let's imagine that just moments ago, I had been scrolling through that social media and, and it was that person, that relationship or that friend where things did not end well and some accusatory thoughts are coming our way. So here, here's the first thought, the doorbell rings and here's this first intruder. The thought says, God could never love a hypocrite like you. God could never love a hypocrite like you. Now, here's so unfortunate. Here's so often what happens in the life of a Christian. Often we go, oh, hey, come on in. I'm so glad that you're here. Hey, come on in, have a seat. Have, or, you must be hungry. Yeah, have a seat. Let's talk. Yeah, you know, I, I, it is true. I am a hypocrite and, and I shouldn't have done that. And, and it is true, God is holy and righteous. And so he must not be able to love someone like me. And then we have a conversation with this thought. And two hours later, we are in despair. That is, would not be an example of taking this thought captive. Instead, to take this thought captive would mean, as I give my thoughts more of Christ, I consider this thought. And I say, you know, there have been times where I have been hypocritical, but God, his grace is so big. His love so abounds that he still loves hypocrites. And so this thought is not a helpful thought. So you know what? You are not invited to a seat at this table. I'm gonna reject you from coming in and just dwelling and me ruminating on this thought all day. Now, we took that thought captive. In that moment, the doorbell rings a second time. There's a second thought that wants to come in. Here's what this thought says. It says, you know, you should apologize for what happened. You should, maybe you should own it. Now, I, I'm incensed because my, my pride has flared up. But the more that I give my thoughts Christ, the more this thought knocks louder at my door. So I wanna invite this thought and give it a seat at the table of my mind. And I want it to lead me towards Christ likeness. In that moment, there's a third uh, knock at the door. Here's what this, this thought says. This thought says, God is disappointed in you. Now I, I'm confused because on the one hand, I, I know God hates sin, but on the other hand, I know that God loves me. So is this a thought of accusation or is this a thought of conviction from God? So before I let this thought come in, I, I gotta do some work. I wanna consider and, and take this thought captive. And here's how I would do that. Here's what I know, conviction from God, it calls me by my name and identifies me as God's child. Accusation identifies me by my sin. Conviction, it points me to look at Jesus. But accusation, it points me to look at my sins. And the more that I think about this, the more it leads me to despair. And so you know what? You are not invited to the dinner table. So long, see ya, you've taken this thought captive. Give our thoughts Christ, take our thoughts captive follower of Jesus. When the enemy, the accuser reminds you of her past, you can remind yourself of the past of Christ crucified. When the accuser points to your fall, we can remind ourselves of the resurrection that he rose. When the accuser intensifies his accusations, remember that you have an intercessor who prays for you. You may have an accuser at your right side, but you have an advocate at the father's side. Let's sing, let's celebrate, let's worship our Jesus who forgives. He has paid it all. Trust
Mariners, this is my favorite time of year. It's a time of family, parties, celebration, and giving. Naturally, money is on our minds as we make plans to give gifts to others. And for many, where we're gonna direct our financial gifts for the end of the year. Jesus gave us the best financial plan in Matthew 6, 20. He says, store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves don't break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Jesus is reminding us that giving is far more a matter of the heart than a matter of money. When you give to your church, three things happen in your heart. Your heart for God grows. You grow in trust and dependence and thanksgiving toward Him. 
Your heart for the church grows. You have a deeper sense of investment in the ministry and the impact our church is making in our cities and our world. And your heart for God's people grows as you see the transformation in the lives of people who discover freedom and grace and love of Jesus, some for the first time, and you get to share in that celebration. This is what we hope for you, that you would experience the transforming joy of generosity in this season. Over the next few weeks, you'll be hearing more about the impact your generosity through Mariners has had over the last year, and more about the vision God's given us to reach more people with the revolutionary news of Jesus' love in 2022. We know that many of you are praying and making decisions about where to direct your giving before the end of the year. And we know this because historically, around 20 to 25% of all the gifts Mariners receives comes in the month of December, which makes a significant impact on our ministry moving forward. Our hope is that as you reflect on what God's word has to say about giving and consider the impact of your generosity, that you'll consider making a gift to Mariners this month. For those of you who've never given, this is a great time to start the journey of generosity. Thank you for praying about your gift to Mariners. We are so grateful to be a place that's known for how we reflect the generous heart of Jesus to the world. That's who our Jesus is. He is so good. He is so kind. Would you hold out your hand and receive God's blessing? Father, these are your children. They love you. They love you because you first loved them and you pursued them and you are still in this moment chasing after them. Would you help us? and remind us that we have an amazing advocate at the Father's side. The accusing, accusing thoughts may come our way, but would your voice always be louder? Would you help us? May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord cause his face to shine upon you, be gracious to you, and may the Lord lift up the light of his countenance towards you and give you peace in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.